if you just come with me then, I want to show you how to use the materials we're going to be working with. Because again, things are, we're, we're, we're about to get much more hands on. So if you come down with me here to the um, uh, Tuesday, um, we are now right here at 9.45. We're about to start discussing screen scraping. Um, the slides are going to be here. That's what you're going to see on the main screen. But I briefly want to introduce you to this annotated code link. And so if you come up here, you'll see that for each of the tutorials we'll be working through today and tomorrow, um, there are clickable interactive um, tutorials that include all of the code that you're going to see up on the screen. Um, these are called code chunks. For those of you who don't know, this is a file format called Markdown. Um, and this is a kind of worked tutorial that takes you through every single step. Um, it includes the output of the code that we'll run and a lot of instructions about um, how to do each technique that we'll talk about, okay? Um, so why do I mention this? I mention this primarily because I wanted to um, relieve you all of taking notes. Um, if you want to follow along in real time, you're welcome to cut and paste the code into um, your coding window. I should say we are using R here um, mostly, um, and that is not a, 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 a philosophical choice. We're very agnostic. If you prefer Python or Julia or whatever is your coding language, great. Um, our main message to you is to learn one co coding language very well. Um, learning the next one is much easier, kind of like learning a foreign language. At least that's been my experience. Um, and we find that most social scientists come from R, and most computer scientists come from Python or C or whatever you code in. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to kind of be patient with each other to arrive at a compromise. Um, but but we'll, we'll, most of our examples are going to be VNR today. Okay. Um, and again, just to those of you who are very new to this field, um, I want you to, or I want to encourage you to focus on learning how to learn. Um, I'm about to throw a lot of information at you. Um, and if you, um, if you feel like you're getting behind, if you're unable to reproduce the steps in real time with me, um, kind of relieve yourself of that instinct to try to master a skill. Um, you know, I'm going to learn how to screen scrape. I'm going to learn how to work with an application programming interface. These are the two things we're about to talk about, right? Instead, um, you know, try, to, try to learn how to learn. Try to focus on identifying the resources you would need um, to do these things. Because as we'll see, um, very often there's no single solution um, to, um, to, to, to extract digital trace data. And we have to learn to be flexible and approach a problem from multiple directions. OK. So here's what I just said about following along. Here's the link if anybody um, didn't find it earlier. OK. So um, one more thing about the slides. Um, these are, again, the, the aforementioned code chunks. So when we are coding together, up top, these are the instructions we're going to put into RStudio, which is the graphical user interface that we typically recommend to work with. Um, and then here at the bottom, in this lower box, you'll see the output of those instructions that we put into RStudio. Um, so this is what it's going to look like on the slides. And again, this is what it looks like in the annotated code. So here's a chunk of code um, where we're going to discuss topic modeling tomorrow. And you see some description of what the code is doing, uh, the code itself, and then the output of the code. OK. So first, let's start with this question, what is screen scraping? And um, typically speaking, um, it means um, identifying a web page that you can legally scrape. Um, I'm going to emphasize the legally. Um, second, we're going to download the source code of that page, usually something like HTML data or XML data. And these are just formats um, that allow a web browser to visualize a page to us. And then very often, we want to parse through that data um, and extract some kind of um, data of interest and create a data set. And usually, we want to do this in an iterative fashion. We want to visit a lot of websites and get a lot of information, right? And populate something like a spreadsheet or a data frame. So the first question to ask, and this has already come up in our discussion of ethics yesterday, um, is, is screen scraping legal? Um, 
I'm going to give you a bit of a cop out. I'm not a lawyer, um, so I can't give you um, legal advice, but I can tell you some best practices. Um, the first is to fir first visit the, the terms of service of a page that you might wish to scrape. And there, very often, you will see something called the robots.txt policy, TXT, um, which very often specifies um, the, um, the manner in which you are allowed to engage with the site in an automated fashion through a computer program. Um, and many people are very discouraged to see that um, it is often the case that the site prohibits screen scraping. And um, we're going to move um, relatively quickly through screen scraping because for a variety of reasons, um, scrapable websites are, are becoming fewer. Um, and websites that are still scrapable are becoming more difficult to scrape. And so typically, many people interested in working with digital trace data will want to use application programming interfaces, which are essentially pipelines for data transfer on the internet where we can make custom requests for large data tables um, rather than doing screen scraping. But almost everyone who works in digital trace data encounters a situation where they want to scrape a web page at one time or another. And so we'll work through a few different ways to do it. Um, but first, the very first step is to establish whether screen scraping that page is legal. Um, the terms of service are a good point of, uh, to, to start with. And of course, contacting the owner of the web page is the, probably the ultimate way to um, determine whether you can legally scrape the page. And I want to point out again, um, you know, there is a, th this has changed, right? There was a, a moment in the history of the internet that I like to call the wild, wild west. You know, people were really scraping everything and anything. Um, and, um, you know, especially young, younger scholars were amassing large amounts of data. Um, and, you know, many of those same scholars received a cease and desist letter from the owner of the site. Um, and I'd like you, to, like you all, especially younger scholars, to imagine the situation where you've scraped a bunch of data, and then several years from now you receive such a letter that effectively tells you you can't publish your dissertation research. Or that paper that was supposed to get you tenure if you're a, an assistant professor or a postdoc, right? So it, it's, it's really important to, to, uh, to understand these, these rules. And I think we have a question from the live stream. Uh, yeah, so, uh, web scraping in R. Elliot from NYU wants to know if you can spend just a little time discussing the pros and cons of R and Python, especially the different packages that exist in each for things like screen scraping, topic modeling, natural sure. language processing. Sure, so we could spend all day on this topic, I'm sure, especially with this crowd. Um, my general reaction is, you know, again, learn, learn one, right? We're, I'm very agnostic about which, which, which package is best. They both have various advantages. I think the, you know, t historically speaking, it was easier to work with um, uh, uh, digital trace data and, and do text analysis in Python. Um, that gap has closed substantially. Um, thanks to uh, the work of uh, a lot of developers in the Tidyverse, which is a family of R packages. Um, and we'll talk about some of those packages tomorrow. We'll talk about some of those packages today. Um, one of the main reasons that I think um, uh, R has advantages for uh, computational social scientists is that it provides really easy access to the state of the art and statistics. And typically, we want to move quickly from collecting digital trace data to analyzing it. And though Python has made amazing strides in Pandas and elsewhere to develop that infrastructure. I think the fact that most uh, faculty in statistics still code in R is a, is a strong case for, for using R. But again, we could talk about this all day. Feel free to have a lively debate on, on Slack. But just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I think I'd like to keep us going. OK. Any other questions? No? OK. So another warning. So often screen, scrape, screen scraping is illegal. Screen scraping is also very often frustrating. Why? Um, because this data is urinal-like, right? It was not made um, for, for you, the researcher, to easily get your data. It was made to help a web browser visualize a web page. And so that, that, that nugget of information that you want is hidden deep within some code that allows a computer to visualize the page. And that means that we have a kind of cat and mouse game to try to find it. And typically, we have to use a, a, a few different approaches um, and a lot of trial and error to figure out uh, where the information lives. It's easy to download the web page, but navigating the web page and finding the piece of information we want is the frustrating part. So we'll begin simply by reading a web page into R. 
Um, we're going to use a package called rvest. This is one of the aforementioned packages from the tidyverse. For those of you who are in the Python language, this is very similar and, and borrows heavily from the beautiful soup package. Um, I don't know the etymology of that name. Um, and that's a very popular package for a module for uh, web scraping in Python. And so um, as we have to do with any R package that's not part of base R, we're going to begin by installing the package here and then um, loading the package into our session of our studio. Um, and we're going to begin by scraping a very simple web page um, from Wikipedia. So you can open it here in the slides, or it's also linked in the uh, markdown file. And what you'll see is this is some data on the ranking of health systems in a number of different countries. And this is a bit of a silly example, because if we wanted to get these data, we would likely just come to this page and you know, say, highlight this table, and then control copy and paste it into um, a, a spreadsheet or something like that. But let's say we wanted to do it for a lot of different web pages that had a similar structure. Um, well, the way we would want to do that is to begin by reading the HTML into R. So this is what the web page looks like to us. right? It has font and visuals um, and hyperlinks and um, Notice that it also has um, a layout and architecture and aesthetics, right? This, this font is larger. It's always at the top. Um, this font is a, uh, a th or this table we all know from browsing Wikipedia um, gives us the kind of the table of contents, right? And, and to our web browser, all of these things are the result of a set of instructions, right? There are parts of HTML code that tell the web browser, put this at the top put it in this font and make it larger text, for example. And that's typically the type of stuff that we don't want to scrape when we scrape a web page. So what does that stuff look like? So I just showed you what it looks like to a, uh, to a human. This is what it looks like to a computer, right? Just nasty, ugly um, HTML, right? And here you can actually see the data we want is actually right in here, or some of it, the, the names of the countries, if you, if you zoom in on your own screens. Um, but um, you know, the rest of that data is hidden somewhere in this HTML. So we have to do quite a lot of legwork to find out um, how to get from this messy chunk of text to that neat table. So the way we're going to do that, the rvest package has a read underscore HTML function. And we can pass the hyperlink or the URL to um, that function. And we will create here an object in R called Wikipedia page. And if we browse that, we see it's a mess, right? It's not at all what we want. And that's because it's part of this HTML file. And HTML um, has a structure that looks something like this. Um, it has a head and a body, it has a tree-like structure. And typically, when we're parsing HTML, we're trying to learn how to tell our, our computer program how to navigate this tree-like structure and find the piece of information we want. So how to tell it to, you know, usually the data we want is going to be in the body of the text. The head typically refers to the aesthetics. Um, and so then, but even in here, and this is a very simple uh, HTML page, um, you know, our data might live down here. And so typically what we do is in a step-by-step -step process try to identify some, um, some codes that help us to identify which branch the information we want is on, and then write some code to go pull out that information. Okay. So um, a nice way to do that, if you use Chrome, um, is to go to your View menu. And if you come down to the Developer dropdown, you'll see something called Developer Tools. If you want, incidentally, if you want to see the source of the page that I just showed you, you could go to View Source, and then your, your Chrome browser will show the source. Um, but if you come to Developer Tools here, um, this pane here will open up. And what you're seeing here is the HTML that we were just looking at alongside the page itself. And what's nice about this tool is that we can click and interact with the page here and learn which, which section of the HTML that data lives in. And the way we do that is to right click near the data we want. In this case, we might click somewhere in our table here that we're trying to scrape. And if we right click, we can select inspect 
And when we select inspect, the, the associated part of the HTML code will be highlighted here, and we can, um, we can then come over to that part um, and discover exactly where in, in, our, in our HTML tree our data live. Um, and if we find that part, we can then right click again, and we can find something called the X path, which is essentially a set of inst instructions that is gonna allow us to parse our HTML. It's gonna tell us exactly where our, our data live. Okay, I know I'm moving fast. Again, if you're trying to follow along in real time, you might wanna step back and, and, and uh, relieve yourself of that duty. Know that all the, the notes and explanations of each step uh, are in that annotated code file that is linked on our webpage. Okay, so now, once we've got that X path, um, we're going to use another function called HTML node. And what that function does is parse the HTML to the node, to the part of that tree that I just showed you, where our data is living. And the HTML node function requires um, several arguments. First, it needs the name of the HTML we're trying to parse. Here, that's Wikipedia page. And then it needs an XPath argument. So that's that chunk of code that we just got by right-clicking um, on the HTML after having in, selected it using the inspect option from the developer tools. Um, and when we pass that and then browse it, so we're using the head command in, in R here, which simply visualizes the first 10 lines of an object, um, we see we're still not where we want, right? We still don't have that neat table. And so we need to use another function, because we've, we've, we've got down to the branch, but within the branch there's still a bunch of stuff. Um, and what we want is this table. Um, and so here if we apply the HTML table function, once we're on the right node, it's gonna pull out all of the table style objects from that node. And um, here I've defined that as a new object called health rankings using my assignment operator here. And then we're simply browsing that object and we see that we've got um, uh, still not super neat and tidy data frame, but we've got a list of countries and we are getting much closer to the data that we actually intended to scrape. So um, we could then go on to transform that object into a data frame or export it as a CSV or whatever we wanna do um, using say the read CSV, uh, write CSV function um, or say putting it into a data table. Um, so, okay, when very often this XPath does not work, or it works um, after much, much um, interaction with the page. Remember, this, this tricky part is, is work interacting with the, H, with, the, with the web page in order to learn which part of the HTML um, you need to work with to find the data. And so it's, it's very often useful to take another path, um, something called the um, CSS selector, and we're gonna use that to work with a more complicated page. Um, this is the home page of Duke University. Um, and as you'll see, unlike our Wikipedia page, there's a, it's, it's a bit of a fancier page. We're pretty fancy here at Duke, right? Um, we've got some interactive features, some JavaScript, which is like allowing different images to, to come up and we can click on them and those are redirecting us. Um, we've got some, um, some news, a news section here that is updated each day. Um, a lot of exciting news here at Duke. And so we are, um, we, we face a greater challenge, right? Why? Because the source code of this page is about 20 times longer than it is for that Wikipedia page. Um, and if you try to use the XPath uh, uh, to, to find this data, um, you may find it's, it, it doesn't work. And so in this case, we can use a, a Chrome plugin called Selector Gadget. And what this tool does is much like the developer tools, it allows us to interact with a web page in order to extract, actually you can get the XPath using this tool as well. We can also get another chunk of code that's useful for parsing HTML called the CSS selector. And so the way this works, once you've, um, once you've installed the plugin, which will take a few minutes, so if you're following along live, you might not be able to do this, um, you'll see a little microscope icon appear at the top of your web browser, okay? Then you'll see this, um, this little tool appear at the bottom of your page. 
And this is the area where your CSS selector code will appear that we're then going to use to pass to one of our um, uh, our vest uh, package um, functions in order to parse out the information we want from this page. The way that the selector gadget works is we first click on the data that we want. So here we are clicking on um, the, uh, the news section. That's what we're in this hypothetical example. We're very curious about what's going on at Duke. So we've, um, we've selected that. And then um, once we do that, we see a lot of other stuff get highlighted in yellow. And we need to then click on the stuff we don't want that's in yellow um, in order to um, and, and, and often this takes multiple trials, um, clicking on different parts of the page in order to reveal a CSS selector down here. I should say you'll get one um, immediately after you start clicking on these yellow things. The trick is finding the right one. And again, this can be a very time intensive process and a very frustrating process. And um, again, combined with the legal restrictions, um, these logistical challenges of screen scraping make it, make it quite frustrating. So here's an example of once we've identified the CSS selector, again, using the uh, selector gadget, um, the process then is very similar. We would simply read in the web page using our read HTML function. Then we would use our HTML nodes function, and here we're passing, instead of the XPath, the CSS selector. Um, and then we're creating another object called Duke events. And then last time we used the HTML table function to extract the table. This time, we want the text. It's not in table format. And so we use the HTML text function. Um, and then we are simply browsing the output here. And you'll see that we got what we want. We got the, the names of the events. Now, if you're following along live, you'll get different events because the web page has changed. But then you'll see all these, these, these funny characters here, right? these slash n, slash t, and so on and so forth. These are a kind of residual mess from our HTML, often called HTML tags, telling um, telling, the, telling the browser, in this case, to start a new line and, and put a space in between um, the text, right? And so we'll, tomorrow we'll go over in some basic text analysis ways to clean up these type of HTML tags in our data, which very often we don't want, especially if we're going to run a text analysis. And we don't want, for example, you know, forward slash T to have a, a meaning. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. Um, I think we have about five minutes, and I want to go over one last tool to have in your toolkit for screen scraping, and then we'll move on to application programming interfaces after the break, um, and then we'll move on to building apps and bots uh, to collect digital trace data. And this final tool is browser automation. Um, again, this is, a, um, this is another way of interacting with a computer in an automated manner, and essentially what we're going to do is instead of finding the page and reading it in and extracting the information, we're actually going to open a computer program um, called Selenium, which controls our entire computer, um, which is a bit scary. I should, just as a little bit of a warning, um, you know, we, we do live in an open source world, and um, you know, it, it's good practice to understand that um, the, the package has been produced by a reliable developer, um, and um, that's often difficult to do, but some good cues are the amount of community, the number of people who are uh, involved in discussions, um, say on GitHub, about the maintenance of the package, um, and also the reputation of the developers. So you can look at reputation um, on GitHub in a number of ways. I think there was a question or a comment. You, start, you tried to start Selenium. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I'll get to that in just one second. Uh, one of the pleasures of browser automation uh, is, is working with um, some very buggy software. Yeah. So long story short, there could be a Java issue. So very often you have to involve, uh, install an older version of Java on your computer to get browser automation to work. And just yesterday, uh, Karsten and Frito discovered that there's a particular issue with the rOpenSci package that was in our code here. And this is a good teachable moment, right? <laughs> in, this, in this landscape, uh, the ground is always moving, right? And this is why I'm so adamant that you need to learn how to learn instead of tr trying to think of, you know, now I've acquired the skill of screen scraping and now I'm going to move on, right? You need, to, you need to know what happens when the package breaks. You know, in this case, um, the code I think I've got here um, isn't working, right? And we, we Googled the error message. We were redirected to a GitHub page. 
um, we discovered an issue, which is a way of tracking what's going on with a package. And lo and behold, two or three comments in a solution. Um, and so if you want to follow along with this code, um, you'd have to do that, unfortunately, depending on, again, what the issue is. It could, it could also be a Java issue. Um, anything to add to that, Frito or Karsten? No, okay, great, okay. Um, so what we're doing, and, and by the way, there is a, um, there's a tutorial linked right here that helps you um, install our Selenium across a number of different um, operating systems. Okay, so what we do essentially once we've got Selenium running is we, we are creating a, a kind of object that allows us to control, in this case, our browser. Um, that's what these two um, functions are doing. And once we do that, we can then, we can then control the object, which is here is called REMDR for remote drive, right? And we can say navigate to, um, to this link. And if we have Selenium installed, and if we run this link, a Chrome browser will open, and it will open www.duke.edu. Um, one, one of the powerful things of browser automation is we can not only give instructions to, say, open a web page, um, but we can also give instructions about how the program should interact with that web page. So in this case, we can find the search box. And in this hypothetical example, we are, uh, let's say we're trying to search for news about data science at Duke. Um, and so here we would use the CSS selector to find the search box using the steps I showed you earlier to identify how to tell Selenium where to click. It's actually literally clicking on the page um, in order to enter a search. And that's what this set of instructions is doing here. Um, and then we can actually tell it which keys to type. We can tell it to type in a search term. We can tell it to press enter. We can tell it to press space or tab or whatever. And these can be advantageous if you're working with a web page that has a lot of interactive uh, uh, JavaScript or you, where you need to go back and forth to interface with the page. Now, very often, these type of pages that require that level of interaction, you are not allowed to scrape. So be aware of that. Um, you know, so for example, uh, something like Google, where um, you, know, you, um, you, you might be able to use browser automation to collect a, a lot of data, um, but Google expressly pre prevents you from doing that for the vast majority of its sites, right? And perhaps more importantly, Google provides alternatives, which we're about to talk about, called application programming interfaces, which are not only legal, um, but much easier to work with and will prepare your data in a neater format um, you might not be able to get the data you want, but again, that might be because it's illegal to get the data you want. Um, so proceed with caution with browser automation. Um, it is just another tool to have in your tool belt, um, but it does test the limits of the robots.txt policy because it begs the question of what is a computer program and what is a person. And probably the lawyers would argue that this is a computer program, and I, I think I would agree with them in many cases. Okay, so I've, I've, I've introduced three tools for screen scraping. In this short lecture, um, in each case, we were just scraping one page to get one piece of information. But again, very often with screen scraping, you're wanting to iterate across a lot of different websites or a lot of different objects. And so to do this, we very often need to write a loop. And if you've done our data camp exercises, um, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have some familiarity with code like this, um, which is telling you how you might take a list of websites and um, create a blank container or a place to store the data that you are going to scrape iteratively from them, and then a set of instructions um, placing the code from earlier within our loop um, with a, uh, a set of instructions about what to change each time through the loop. Um, this code, by the way, will not work, and there's an intentional reason for that to explain to you that it's very often the case that unless you are going to scrape the same web page and the same the same web page that has a, same, a very similar structure to another web page, um, you're going to have to write custom code for each page that you're going to scrape. And so another major disincentive for screen scraping is that let's say we wanted to scrape all the pages of major US or international universities to get information about computational social science. Um, well, we'd be dealing with dozens or hundreds or thousands of, of different types of web pages. And so we may very quickly find ourselves in the world where writing the code to scrape those pages takes longer than going to those pages manually and scraping that pages. And that's an, yet another reason why very often we don't want to use screen scraping. But let me, let me in conclude with a brief discussion of good 
um, good times or ideal cases for screen scraping. These are very often more simple websites. So gov many government websites do not pro prohibit screen scraping. Um, some administrative data live on non-protected um, websites. In particular, if these are older websites that have the same structure, and if there's a particular pattern in the URL that allows you to say, look at the top of the URL in your browser and say, oh, it looks like the date is changing at the end of the URL. And each time I change the date, then I get a different list of information. If it's something as simple as that, um, then you can simply write a loop that then says, you know, change the date by using some type of concatenate function. In R, that would be the paste function. And change the URL that you are passing to our read HTML function that I just described in an iterative fashion. OK, so that's it for screen scraping. If folks in the live stream have questions, I'm happy to answer them on Slack uh, later today. Um, and when we come back from our break, we'll be talking about application programming interfaces. Thank you. <laughs>